Hello, everyone. It's one o'clock, and we are starting the Survivor Leadership Series sponsored by the Human Trafficking Legal Center and Survivor Alliance. My name is Martina Vandenberg, and I am temporarily filling in for Roxy Farrow, who's our operations manager who runs the Survivor Leadership Program at the Human Trafficking Legal Center. And before we turn to the main event, which is Deborah Pembroke, uh, who will speak today about the necessity of survivor leadership, I'd like to introduce our co-sponsor, Maria Lozano from the Survivor Alliance, just to say a few words about Survivor Alliance. Maria? Hello, uh, welcome everyone. We are very pleased to be part of this uh, series of uh, webinar on survivor leadership. Um, um, would like to thank you, Deborah, to, for being the speaker to this morning, afternoon, morning, evening, here is evening in the UK. And thank you to the uh, Human Traffic Legal Center for hosting it. So uh, I don't know, I would like to say uh, briefly that Survivor Alliance is a, a, a survivor lead organization. It is a network that have members in about 20 countries. And um, basically, we try to empower and unite the survivors around the world, providing a professional uh, advice and professional development opportunities, as well as a large network of survivors. Thank you very much, everyone, to be here. And that's it for my end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. So I want to introduce Deborah Pembroke, and we're only going to go until two o'clock today. So we have a short little window of time, and we want to leave lots of time for questions. Well, one, <laughs> one o'clock starting DC time and two o'clock ending DC time. So I know that there are people from all different time zones on the on the call today. Deborah Pembroke is a long recognized leader in the human trafficking movement. Um, she is the human trafficking outreach manager at a non-governmental organization in Watsonville, California that focuses on rape crisis, but also has worked in the movement for years and years and has been a powerful voice um, about the importance of survivor leadership. And she has also um, worked with the National Survivor Network for years. And so I have followed Deborah Pembroke's work uh, through the Freedom Network and through other outlets for almost a decade, and it's it's really an, an honor to have you speak today. So Deborah, I'm gonna turn off my video and hand this over to you. Deborah has said that she'd like to have questions throughout, so if you have questions, please put them in the questions box and I will uh, let Deborah know that you have them, thanks. Well, it is amazing to be here with all of you and thank you. Um, Martina, thank you so much for um, that kind introduction. And um, Maria, it's so good to have met you on this call. And uh, I just really can't say enough about what a fantastic organization Survivor Alliance is and Human Trafficking Legal Center. So it's really just an incredible um, honor to be here um, talking with all of you. Um, so in saying some things about myself, I wanted to share um, we talk about the necessity of survivor leadership. I think in myself, in approaching this topic, for a long time, for really all of my adult life, I wanted to find a way to have a voice in ending the kinds of things that happened to me. And my experience is um, my trafficking experience happening in my childhood. So for me, entering adulthood, I was able to get away from that experience. But so this became this overarching just desire that ran through so much of my life, wanting to find a way to be um, working to end what had happened to me for other, so that other people didn't have to experience what I'd experienced. And I'd seen this, and you know, much of my adult life as I tried to navigate early adulthood and building a career and um, and just being in the world, um, I found successful or not successful ways to to do that. And um, it wasn't really until the movement formed that I, the anti-trafficking movement and my involvement in it really in the last 10 years, that I was able to really feel like I was working with other people and really creating that kind of change. Um, so 
as I stepped into working as an advocate, I, I work as an advocate at a rape crisis center in Salinas, California, um, and in Monterey County in California. This is along the central coast of California. Um, as I started working one-on-one -on -one with um, people who were really immersed in trauma, people who were experiencing trafficking and other kinds of violence in our community, what I started hearing was something that sounded really familiar, that when I was working in, you know, in an, in an emergency room with someone who just had, you know, terrible things happen in their lives, embedded in what they were sharing with me about what had happened, about what justice they wanted to see, what they thought was possible for their life now, embedded in that was this incredibly deep desire to stop what had happened to them to happening to other people. When I was in incarcerated settings, talking with people who um, were stripped of so many different rights in their lives, had so few resources in their life. I was hearing the same message over and over again. I don't want what happened to me to be happening to other people. And this is the knowledge that I'm bringing to this conversation that, you know, that having a voice in working against trauma, working against the abuses we experience, working against human trafficking is so often feels so deep in us as survivors that it feels like a necessity. Now, there are times over the course of my life, I talk to different therapists who maybe frame this as a PTSD reaction, maybe frame this as um, a way to still be um, engaging in my trauma. And I've really come to understand this as this incredibly positive force in my life that this is in a very deep, authentic voice in myself, and I can't help but see that as an equally deep, authentic voice in the so many people I've talked to, often in places of such um, trauma and inability to create that change. And so when we acknowledge how deep this necessity for survivor leadership is, not just within survivors, but when we look at movements that have really created a change and created difference in the world throughout history, we see survivors right there creating that change. Okay, so let me talk about um, what we're going to talk about because I've kind of grouped this in three different buckets. Why survivor leadership? I um, want to talk about, um, share some different research we've done here in California um, to help understand. Um, not just survivor leadership in its broadest sense, but also in particular in the anti-trafficking movement. I want to talk about different barriers, systemic, institutional, and personal barriers, and also how to dismantle them. Now, I want to say we're just going to be touching on ways to really like tear all these different barriers apart, um, but so often we're able to do that work in community, and we're here with organizations like Survivor Alliance, and as Martina said, um, the National Survivor Network in the US, um, different organizations were able to work together to dismantle these barriers. And then once we really sit in the truth of survivor leadership and how necessary it is and how we need more of it, um, then we can talk about some nuts and bolts about how. Okay, I also wanna just share some things about where I'm talking to you all from. Um, I'm on the central coast of California. We're um, I know this is recorded. We are in the heart of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, where I am in particular, um, Northern California is in the immersed, is immersed in some of the most dramatic and serious wildfires that we've seen in Northern California, many different fires throughout um, Northern California. Um, one of the people I wanted to consult um, about um, some aspects of this um, webinar and preparing it for you is um, is out in the um, Vantana wilderness um, fighting wildfires right now. Um, so we have survivor leaders on the forefront of working with these fires as well. So um, um, that's part of where I am. And I also wanted to acknowledge I'm speaking to you all from Native American land that um, this is um, Ohlone and Costanoan um, native space for um, and um, native Californians who are here, and also just south of me in the um, 
Montana wilderness, like I just mentioned, was the um, uh, the first people of that land um, over the Esalen, um, where we have an amazing survivor leader here in our community who's also tribal chairperson with um, uh, the Esalen community and who's out fighting wildfires right now. Okay, so why survivor leadership? So I'm going to start with this question. What is leadership? Because probably as many people as are on this um, webinar right now, there are probably many different definitions of leadership. And so I wanted to invite you, um, I, it, as I understand it, we have a, a, a question, we have a window for questions. Um, right now I'm talking about the window for it that's called chat. So if you wanna type in the chat um, and just what your definition of leadership is, and while you're typing that, I'm just going to share some definitions I've heard. Um, one comes from another survivor, survivor leader, Rachel Lloyd. She talks about leadership being the combination of experience, expertise, you know, working in your sector, gaining expertise, and education. Um, I've also had the um, the um, benefit of um, taking a short class from Ernesto Cortez, um, a MacArthur Genius recipient and um, the founder of, or the, excuse me, not the founder, but the um, director of the IAF Foundation, when we talk about President Barack Obama having a history of working community organizing. Um, a lot of that work was done with IAF in Chicago. Um, so um, Ernie Cortez, he defines power, not leadership, but power as either organized money or organized people. And so for community organizers, for people who don't maybe have that organized money, we can see that leadership is always relational. And so he shares a story of going into a large um, space, I think it was a church, and presenting a plan for community organizing, asking the room of like 500 people, if they were willing to adopt this plan and every head in the auditorium turned from facing him at the front of the room and turned and looked at the back of the room to a woman who had been in the kitchen and was laying out food in the back of the auditorium. And with every head turned to her, she gave a nod and then everyone turned back to him and was ready to move forward. That that is the embodiment of relational leadership of um, if you come into a space and you think it's that expertise and that ed education, if you're looking for titles, you might be missing that relational leadership. Um, so I see in the chat, someone's entered, put in here, they see leadership as empowerment of others to lead. So leadership happens together that, you know, there's a, a, a faith, um, a phrase that comes out of African-American women's history that we lift as we climb that as we step into leadership, we bring, uh, you know, not just our ancestors and our history, but we bring other people with us into leadership. Um, so yeah, if you have more ideas of what you consider leadership to be, feel free to just keep putting that in the chat. Okay, so I wanted to share some examples of survivor leadership, literally from throughout human history. Um, Rabia Basra, who um, uh, is, um, a famous Sufi mystic and poet um, was uh, Rumi, another Sufi poet um, who from four centuries later um, considered Rabia of Basra to be um, one of his greatest teachers. Um, she was um, uh, labor trafficked in a royal court. She was a, a musician. Um, and some people, some historians say that that was actually, um, she wasn't trafficked as a musician, but that it was a, um, euphemism for sex trafficking. Um, Miguel um, de Cervantes, um, one of the greatest novelists of our time, the author of um, Don Quixote um, in the 16th century. Um, he had been trafficked on a pirate ship for many, many years. Frederick Douglass, a, a famous um, a leader coming out of lived experience. Billie Holiday, who was trafficked, um, uh, well, and with all these historical figures, I should say that their experience 
would be legally defined as trafficking today. Of course, this is more modern language for it, for these historical figures, but she experienced commercial sexual exploitation in her childhood. And um, uh, Nadia Murad, who's the winner of um, the recipient of the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize. Now, I wanted to share all of these survivor leaders because I also wanted to point out that each one of these leaders has reached not just um, um, made strides in the anti-trafficking movement or made strides in ending the kinds of things they experienced. Each one of them reached the absolute pinnacle of human achievement. You know, these are people who, you know, Cervantes, who's considered one of the greatest writers in human history, one of the first people to like creator in um, Europe of the of novel as an existence, one of the greatest writers in the Spanish language. Um, that these are people who who are some of the greatest achievements of all time, certainly in their own sector. That, so when we talk about survivor leadership, I want to be really clear about my perspective that there is no, there is no almost or um, almost as good as or halfway to survivor leadership. That when we look at some of the greatest achievements in human history, we see survivors standing shoulder to shoulder with people who have all different kinds of lived experience. That survivors are, have a full humanity. That survivors have the full potential of of anyone else that has ever lived. Um, okay, so when I now I want to kind of narrow in on because so many people when we think of survivor leadership, what we are um, where we're interested in expressing that leadership can be in so many different sectors, but we've had some good data about how survivor leadership is viewed and what some of these barriers are that comes out of a, um, a research study I was involved with, with the California CSEC Action Team Advisory Board. Um, the advisory board is made up entirely of human trafficking survivors. Um, this is the second cohort. The study that I'm going to share um, was um, conducted by uh, Chelsea Rouse, Annika Mack, um, Ori Friedman, who's in the center of this photograph, um, and the red shirt, actually the, the red shirt on the right, um, kind of in the dead center, and myself. And this study reached out to organizations in California that um, serve survivors of commercial sexual exploitation, um, child survivors of commercial sexual exploitation. And this included rape crisis centers like our agency, um, Department of Social Services, um, foster care, different organizations that intersected with the lives of children who experienced um, uh, sex trafficking and asked first about their own perceptions of how important survivor leadership is for that field. And what we found was pretty staggering. 92% of respondents of these different organizations, the people who do hiring in these different organizations said that they had a desire to hire survivor leaders. They saw that survivor leaders and survivor advocates improved their services, were better able to reach the youth they were working with. And despite this, their own perception that this increased the quality of their services, only 27% had any survivor leaders on staff. Um, and I believe it was 36 had ever hired a survivor um, in, uh, knowing, knowingly in their um, organization. We also found there was an incredible amount of confusion about the term survivor informed, where 65% said their own agency was survivor informed, but only 27%, as we said, um, had ever hired um, a survivor. And now when we drilled in, I'm not sharing, going to share all the results of this um, report, but Another piece of this was that um, of those 27%, almost all, I believe all except one of those people who were well, the position they actually held was an entry level position. So there was um, a real, um, even though there was acknowledgement of the importance of having survivor leadership in these organizations, there was a cap that was put on so many of them. So I hope 
this helps all of us not just understand survivor leadership, but also have some tools to advocate for survivor leadership in our community to be able to answer the question why survivor leadership my cat who never meows is i hear kind of wailing in the background so um uh shelter in place um coming here from home um so if my cat makes an appearance i'll just consider that a good thing um, um so while the cat is meowing it just gives us a quick moment because we have a really good question oh yeah i want to throw in so one participant has asked, did you come to a place where you realized that being a survivor isn't enough? I felt like I had to put degrees behind my experiences in order to get considered a professional and that they, those degrees made me credible. Yeah, well, um, this is such an important question. Um, this, you know, what is the right moment for me to step into survivor leadership? And do I need to, um, do I need to do something else to gain expertise? To, sometimes, um, do I need different licenses? Sometimes those licenses are barred from survivors who may have different, you know, um, um, records or other barriers. So this is an incredibly important question. And it's also a deeply personal question. So for myself, I think back to that story I shared of the, of the grandmother in the back of the church auditorium who gave a little nod and the whole room was going to move on, on her approval. Um, that to create the change we want, we have all different kinds of skills. Now I imagine that was a, a deeply skilled individual um, that was able to have that kind of relational power with this, whole, with this large group of people that she, um, who would follow, who were following her. So there are so many ways we can be leaders. Now, sometimes we see that there's a particular opportunity or a particular way we want to do our work um, that requires a title, that requires a, a license, um, I, particularly people who want to work in the healing arts, whether that's um, a credential around body work, a credential around um, social work or, um, you know, so th there's not easy answers to that. But what I can say is that there's innate, powerful, world-changing leadership ability of everyone who's here at this webinar. And there's um, ways we as a community can lift that up with credentials or not. Does that and answer that question? Deborah, I just also wanted to flag that there are a large number of comments on what leadership is that are now in the chat. Oh, if okay. There's a lot of people have weighed in. You know, I think I might not be seeing these. Um, so because I, so I was I had planned on reading those and I didn't see that many. Um, so Martina, could I ask you to just read some of these? I'd be happy to. Let me just pull them up. And they're coming into the question box. So you can, if you look in the question box, you might see them there. I want to see the educating, box. Yeah, educating and building relationships to help each other reach their common goal. Being willing to stand and speak so that others are aware and encouraged to do the same. Strength in numbers, even if at first it is not popular or socially acceptable topic. So oh, I, I think love that. You, yeah, you've seen, and then leadership is trust and service. Ooh. When we talk about relational power, that person just really zoomed in on the core. So much of the core of that is built on trust. I love this. These are these are powerful um, responses. Um, I'm going to take a process moment because I would love to see these. These are brilliant. Um, um, I don't know why I'm not seeing the the questions. Oh well. I'm not going to take more of a process moment for this then. So thank you so much for those fantastic answers. Maybe Martina, if you don't mind um, continuing to share them, if they continue to come in. I will. Um, okay. Well, thank you. Um, okay. And I just got a little notice. Any any problems with my audio quality or my webcam or um, just do another process moment because I just got an error message. Any issues? 
Are you there? So I think it's okay, but if anybody does have problems, please put it in the questions box or the chat box and we'll try and troubleshoot. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so barriers and how to dismantle them. So I imagine, sadly, that those of you on the call may have experienced some barriers to really fully encountering your ability to be leaders in whatever sector you're working in, in your community, in the survivor movement, in the anti-trafficking movement. So I wanted to ask just, you know, I, we there's a lot we could all share here, um, but if you, if, if you had a way of quickly summarizing that, um, so if you could enter that into um, the, um, the, the chat window or the question window. You know, I know barriers I've heard from other um, survivors are um, things we've already touched on on this call, um, not being seen as an expert, even with all of this lived experience that people will come to us for, um, even though we are often training all the people around us on the basics of uh, our experience, the basics of human trafficking, we're still not seen as the, having the right credentials or the right experience or the right um, uh, expertise. Um, all of those can be barriers. Um, does anything come in at this point, um, yeah, Martina? Yeah, someone, someone wrote in relation to your to the answer that you gave to the prior question about this need for degrees. Uh, the person wrote, agreed, degrees give you acceptance and being open as a survivor. You're still paid less than another. You're paid minimum wage or you're encouraged to volunteer, limiting the ability to help change and improve services. <laughs> I want to say so much enters into that too, that um, you know, racism comes to play with this, um, um, xenophobia. The, the, there's so many different kinds of systemic barriers that we see. In um, well, I think as someone who's doing this webinar from the United States, I'm thinking of this so as so um, on display right now in the United States, and you know, over and over again, I see people with um, you know, degree after degree after degree who aren't seen as having that level of expertise because they're a survivor, because they're a person of color, and because they're indigenous, because of um, these different um, things that could put on us where, um, um, and um, so um, it's so well put by um, that, um, that person. Anything more? Should I move on? No, I think we can go on. That's all I see for the moment. Okay. So I've talked about survivor leadership, um, particularly in the rape crisis center space, in creating um, long, taking long-standing services, um, trauma-informed services that are serving um, often smaller populations where there's not enough funding to support a standalone anti-trafficking organization where they're retooling to include labor, um, to, excuse me, to include human trafficking. And so when I'd done these different trainings, I'd reached out to the survivor community to say, what barriers have people experienced? Not to leadership, but to just getting help, to just getting services. And so I wanted to share um, from a informal survey I'd done through social media, some of the responses I heard about not just having your voice heard but even just having someone see you to to help you someone you may especially these organizations that are getting funding for helping um people like us so i'm going to read some of these and as i'm reading these i'd like you to think about if you hear of any isms any systemic barriers like racism like xenophobia like transphobia like homophobia like these these larger systems where it's not just one person experiencing a barrier to an, with um, an organization, but that it really ties into historical trauma and these larger movements in our culture. So one survivor said that labor trafficking survivors aren't 
seen as survivors. And so she is a labor trafficking survivor, wasn't seen as someone who could be helped. As a Native American survivor, the survivor said, I feel invisible. I had to teach my therapist what trafficking is. I was isolated because of my gender identity and my sexual orientation. They told me what I experienced wasn't trafficking. They wouldn't work with me because my trauma was too severe. I got a circular reference. I got different referrals, but I got no help from any of those referrals. They told me that stuff only happens in Thailand. And then one survivor said, I so don't even know where to start. So I'll check in with the chat again. Um, if you, do you hear any systemic, systematic societal level issues that are coming to play here with a survivor just being able to access services? Martina, are you seeing anything entered in there? So I'm watching, please do, either in the questions or in the chat, please do, uh, please do add um, your comments. So I see one that says, it sounds like racism. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else want to add anything? Well, you know, one of the things that troubles me, Deborah, actually, that I have heard again is this circular referral list where people call and call and call and never get assistance. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? We hear this over and over again, and I, I will say that this I find as an advocate, not just as a survivor, but as someone who wants to connect people to the help that's available, this one is just so painful for me because as an advocate, your job is not done until the help is delivered. And for so many people, they think that, you know, they have their scope and the end of the day, as long as they are working in their scope and have given the referrals they need that, that they think will connect someone, um, that their job is done. And yet we have survivor after survivor after survivor with really clear, tangible needs that where it is just not working. And, you know, it's not okay for a rape crisis center, for a domestic violence shelter, for a human trafficking organization that serves traumatized people. It is not okay to not return a call. It is not okay to not return a call to for months later. And yet I, when I talk at the organizational level, no one says that's happening. And when I talk to survivors, I hear that it's happening over and over and over again. And, um, this is um, part of why we need survivor leaders, because the work isn't done when, you know, you finish the call and, you know, check off your paperwork. The work is done when survivors are connected to their full lives and are able to have security and safety and able to um, um, uh, reach our own goals. So, Deborah, there are more comments coming in. One is uh, on housing, being treated like a child, being shut down. I've been told numerous times that I don't have the appropriate education. I've told that I'm not an expert and I'm not what they're looking for. And one person says, I'm currently looking into leadership. I bet I don't know how to, I don't know how to articulate my vision and sell it to others. Uh, I see discrimination because of, because of what I went through on the internet. And that's very difficult to remove. I'm in New Jersey that's and a lot real. of programs don't have survivors as part of the team and we were ignored. So there are a lot of comments coming in. I don't know if you would address those and then I can do more. I, you know, I have so many thoughts from so many of those. One thing I wanna just name is um, the first one was housing. And it was incredibly eye-opening for me to read um, the UN's Declaration of Human Rights. Um, this is a statement that was ratified in the 40s, uh, ratified by every organization that's a part of the United Nations, and it acknowledges that housing is a human right. Housing should be a human right for survivors. And we all know, and I, I mean, when Martina and I were talking about this right before the webinar, that when housing is not treated like just a basic human right, when, you know, people are going homeless in mass just because of a pandemic, um, that this increases vulnerability to trafficking um, so dramatically. And 
Um, so that housing was one of these barriers is um, just an incredible injustice and we should name it as what it is. It's a violation of human rights. Um, oh, there was just so much in what you read that I wanted to respond to. And then I got was talking about human rights and um, uh, people were, um, I remember people were saying um, the need for credentials and um, a question I have is how many of those people who do have those credentials come to survivor leaders to and, and are packaging our experience in academic language in order to, um, to, to validate their own research. That um, you know, we, are, um, we are here, we are a part of every social justice movement and our expertise really matters. Um, and um, so, I mean, one of these barriers that I see is really systemic, it's just an ignorance of human trafficking, that human trafficking is framed as just child sex trafficking. Human trafficking is framed as something that um, only happens to particular people in particular countries, or um, that, um, that someone who's in their own, their own ignorance saying, what happened to you isn't what you know, you know to be true that your experience is legally and um, and 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 other ways as well defined as human trafficking. Um, but you know, it it's it costs nothing for these agencies to say no. Um, but that's um, that's an injustice. So Deborah, another comment that's come in is uh, individuals who are not survivors have stated a survivor has experienced trauma, sometimes complex trauma, addictions, but not everyone. Mm -hmm. We as an organization or agency prefer not to hire survivors just in case they become traumatized or their addiction comes back. Well, if this was a talk for organizations um, and someone were saying something like that, I would um, feel very, I, I would caution any organization was saying um, we don't hire based on trauma because they are hiring people who are traumatized. And so if the, if what they think will keep them safe, from having problems in their organization is discriminating around past lived experience um, and ignoring maybe the vicarious trauma, the trauma that can happen in doing this work, um, then I, I just, I see that as a recipe for trouble for that organization. We'll talk about vicarious trauma in a minute, um, um, but um, yeah, such good, such richness, such good comments, everyone, thank you. Um, was there anything just one Is more. That I'm, just one more. Uh, most people still are afraid of the triggers that we as survivors can experience in a workplace. And I know there are a couple of people with their hand up. If you have a question, please put it in the question box, and and we'll definitely get it get it out there. Thanks. Yeah. Um. Uh, thank you. Um. I'm sorry. Did I miss the question there? Um. I think I did. Did you read another question? No, there, there's one more that's come in that that sometimes people face difficulties with criminal records as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, this this incredible discrimination that happens. I I believe this is particular in the U.S. My work is pretty centered in the United States, and I know there are people calling in from everywhere, which is, from all over the world, which is um, amazing. Um, um, but here in the U.S., there's just such. Um, uh, uh, hyper incarceration that happens and um, that happens to human trafficking survivors absolutely disproportionately um, it's happened um, even though we've made some strides in the last few years it's um, many of us ha you know have a long history um, so um, that's absolutely um, a, a way that um, discrimination plays out so these are larger systemic barriers there's a remarkable work being done by survivors to change, um, uh, to, cr to create a more anti-racist future, to create a future with um, based more on restorative justice than on incarceration. And sometimes they're doing this work naming themselves as um, survivor leaders, sometimes not. That's a totally legitimate path. Um, but there's survivors at the forefront of working on all of these um, movements to, to change these systemic barriers. I wanted to share a quote from an anonymous survivor that um, also came in from these different um, statements. Um, 
She says, I ended up creating my own healing modality. And weirdly, that years later led me to do what I do now. I planted the seed in myself and for some training too, which grew into seeds for others. I found my own way, but it would have been great for them, the agencies that, I, that she turned to, it would have been great for them to have staff that understood what had occurred in my life or to at least have the language to pass on to me so I could begin to understand it all. And what I see in this quote from this survivor is how we find our own way that we will work with the allies that are able to work with us but whether it's finding healing in our own life which we are remarkable at or creating change in our communities creating change on a grand, on a grand scale we are finding our own way despite these barriers so that same study from the CSEC advisory board asked what they perceived of their studies. And I'm just gonna to touch on this. Um, they said they thought there was an insufficient hiring pool, people who didn't have the right kind of education, training, licensing, they didn't have the funds to hire, um, background checks and license concerns. And all of those we could and do if this was a training for, for, these, or, for these organizations, we drill into those. But I wanted to just share what if we take a step back from all of that language and hear what language they're using it's the language of lack there's a lack of funds there's insufficient um uh, uh hiring pool there's all of this absence of what they need and we see this you know in the the people who give that circular referral where they see their job is done if they've given you a number for someone else to call even though they know for sure you're not going to get the help you need from that number this you know continuing to go with the flow even though we're not doing the work has a name and that name in my mind is vicarious trauma that when someone maybe has devoted their entire life their entire career their life energy to trying to create change in the world as our allies and what they're focus on is the lack they know they know 92 percent of them know that survivors make their services better survivor leaders help them reach the people they most want to reach in greater numbers but yet they're focused on all of this different lack it's very hard for us as survivor leaders to understand why they would be so closed down as our allies without understanding vicarious trauma. Now, everyone on this call who is a survivor knows a lot about trauma and healing from trauma. And I, and I wanna be really clear that our allies, the people who are here working shoulder to shoulder with us, but are not themselves, um, people who've experienced human trafficking, they may have experienced trauma as severe, greater as severe um, as ours. And I, I, for example, I mentioned I chair a coalition. One of our former board members, uh, Robert Taniguchi, was someone who had himself lived experience of being incarcerated as a child in Japanese internment camps, something that um, our community of the United States government did during World War II. Even though he had a childhood of being literally raised in a prison, his entire family, his entire community imprisoned, a different experience in human trafficking, but he was able to work through that trauma himself and work shoulder to shoulder with human trafficking survivors um, to create change in our community. That there's incredible range of ability to work with trauma, but there's also some real difficulty in dealing with vicarious trauma. That we often have trouble naming. So some examples of vicarious trauma are diminished creativity and inability to embrace complexity, inability to listen, deliberate avoidance of problems. That person who, um, when they talk about their services, talk about how they're right there for a survivor. But what we actually know when we talk to survivors is that they actually take months to just return a call. That deliberate avoidance, um, fear, anger, cynicism, inability to empathize and numbness in the face of trauma, grandiosity, thinking like, oh, I'm the only one who can do this. 
we experience this often when we're talking with our allies and when we understand it as their own trauma response because the work of fighting injustice has its own trauma to it when we understand this we can use the tools we've used to understand our own trauma to have more compassion to be able to truly open more doors um, and around this so Understanding vicarious trauma is not just useful in taking the tools we've, the mastery we've developed in understanding the trauma from the overwhelming um, abuse that we've experienced and uh, helping us to apply that to the work that we do as leaders. It also helps us understand our allies in the movement who maybe, I mean, if I'm real, like some of them just don't have the same skills in understanding their own trauma that um, survivor leaders have to have to be able to come to the table. Now barriers, I'm also talking about how to dismantle barriers and I want to just also share a book that I find to be pretty remarkable in really tackling vicarious trauma head on it's called Trauma Stewardship. It's a very funny book. It's a very engaging book by Laura Vandernoot Lipsky and it's an everyday guide for caring for yourself while caring for others. Um, it's helpful in understanding our own vicarious trauma in the work, but like I said, also for understanding why there's barriers, institutional barriers, when we come to um, try to do work that it just is so logical that they would want to work side by side with us. Now, in talking about barriers, I also want to name there are personal barriers, and these personal barriers can be encountered when you're starting to look at your life and leadership in whatever sector you're working with, particularly if you're working in the anti-trafficking movement, um, barriers to your own personal safety. Um, many survivor leaders have gone through some, um, their own um, deep work in needing to keep themselves safe. And so in considering opening that door to going public, not going public, these um, understanding as best you can your own um, your own situation around your own personal safety from your trafficker or from the trafficking situation. Legal issues. So especially if you're considering stepping into survivor leadership that's named as survivor leadership, that you're acknowledging yourself as a survivor, um, these legal issues can be really significant. Um, whether or not to use your identity or your name. Uh, if we go back to some of these historical survivor leaders, um, I think two of the five um, had, uh, well, um, some of them, some of that may not be the same kind of identity, but, you know, survivor leaders have used alternative names um, throughout history, and that um, can be a powerful way to keep our identity. All of us probably have audiences we want to speak to and audiences we want to avoid. Um, this um, um, has always been true around people who co-opt human trafficking to use for their own agenda and not the agenda that survivor leaders have of ending human trafficking in one form or another but getting their own funding or elevating their own platform um, this has just i want to name this has just um, blown up in the last few mo in the last few months with um at least um, my perspective as someone in the us um, and the pervasiveness of the QAnon. Uh, movement, um, some uh, group that's um, co-opted anti-trafficking in to um, in this um, in this particular conspiracy theory. So, being very careful about what audiences we speak to, um, understanding that none of us are um, in this alone. We have relationships and family, and they can all be impacted by this. Our own emotional readiness, and then impact on our future. That. Um, um, we all have long, full careers, and um, particularly when we think about stepping into create making change where we're out about our experience as survivors. Okay, Deborah, there's a really good question that's come in. Yeah, great. Um, a question. There's a barrier from how to transition from just owning and sharing your story to actual leadership. I think lots of people have a sympathetic ear for survivors' stories, but how do we allow our voice to have weight or merit? Oh, I love this question. I love this question because it's epidemic. It's an epidemic among survivor leaders that so many people only perceive the value of survivor leadership 
for sharing the like worst moments of our lives. And that rather than being seen as, you know, um, you know, the, um, the people who create some of the, the greatest works of art in the human history and the greatest social movements in human history. And like, rather than being seen as people who can be in the forefront, we have this like small little container that is what so many people wanna put us in. And I have a slide in a minute um, that talks about all the different alternatives to public speaking and sharing our story that we can think about, even just in the realm of the anti-trafficking movement. Um, for ways we can um, break out of that mold. Um, at the same time, the skill of knowing what we want to share. There are things about my story that, um, you know, I often, when I talk about my experience, I often limit it to just a few sentences of my traumatic history of my childhood. I summarize my childhood in a few sentences, and then I talk much more about my life once I got free. And that's a decision I made because it hurts every time I tell my story and I wanna limit that. Um, I also, um, you know, it's it's complex and it's hard and, um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm astounded by the bravery of people who really go to those deep, hard, painful places and are able to do it with such grace. Um, but having the space to really know for yourself, these are the things I'm never gonna share publicly because we should all have those. These are the things I am going to um, to share, and it may be nothing. I mean, maybe no one else knows um, outside of your private circle. No one else knows the the deeper reasons why you do this work, um, or or what drives you to succeed in whatever sector you're working with. But these are very important questions. So great question. I'm hoping as we talk about the how of survivor leadership and the time we have together. Um, I'm hoping to touch on um, more on that question. So, Deborah, you have just a tsunami of excellent questions that have come in. Oh, really? I just read one of them as you move on to the next section, because I think I've been going through them. I think this one's very relevant to your next section. Um, this survivor asks, is, is this for their fundraising? Do they want me to tell my story for their fundraising? They want to hear our stories. They want the, to, the detail. They want they want to go into grisly details. The more grisly, the better. It's like a slideshow, and I refuse to get that. I want to talk about how I felt, or how about how I felt powerless about being exploited and manipulated, and the things that happened in my life that set me up that I don't want to be there. Uh, in survivor story quotation marks. You are you are like I can tell that I am surrounded by people who like I'm trying to talk about this kind of on an introductory level because that's how I talked about it in the description, but I can tell from this question that there are people here who are already like in the graduate school of survivor leadership. So thank you so much for all the wisdom embedded in that question, which was really a sharing. Um, um, I'm hoping, um, I, I am gonna move on because I know of time, but I'm hoping to just amplify the point that um, this survivor just made so well of um, we have so much expertise that goes way beyond um sharing the, the the worst moments of our lives um i'm gonna uh, skip this question just or this question of the group because you guys have so many good questions that i think will um help to um uh to do to rather than do another interactive piece you know leave a little time for those questions um so i wanted to share with you the survivor leadership ladder this is an adaptation from the youth engagement ladder um, but it's an understanding that within an organization, um, there are many different ways a survivor leader can express that leadership. Now, this is in an existing organization. In, few, in a slide in a moment, we'll talk about other ways. But in that question we just had, we saw not just tokenism, someone being brought forward to share their story, but really their story being used to color the work of an organization. And this is really the very base level, the very most, I would say, exploitive level of survivor leadership, which is using survivor stories to decorate the work of an organization. And we wanna make sure we're always moving up out of these um, basement level, um, um, token or decoration level 
um, survivor leadership and moving into more agency for survivors. Next level would be assigned, but not informed. We're given tasks to do. Um, that entry level where um, someone um, uh, is assigned tasks, but doesn't have say in the real change in the organization. Um, informed dialogue where an organization is in communication with a survivor, but still these are very low level leadership. Le um, but then when we start to move into ally initiative where survivors are initiating and having real shared decision making in the work of an organization, leading to survivor initiated in partnership, it's not just survivor led, but also initiate, um, survivor initiated, but also led. And then the highest level where the organization is literally governed by survivors. We often see this, not exclusively, but we often see this in survivor founded organizations. The key to unlocking our leadership in the movement, in different sectors, in, in different, in art, in different industries, in entrepreneurship, the key to Unlocking our true own authentic leadership is understanding our personal goals. Now there are exterior goals um, that I have down here at the bottom. And because of the question we had, I just want to jump right to that. Um, the, you know, will you speak at our gala? Be, um, because that's a way for you to have your voice heard. Can we include your picture in our agency's brochure? This is what will raise awareness. Now that is a very different approach than you finding in yourself that you want to make sure that there's more awareness, that you want to make sure your voice is heard. Someone coming to you and saying, this is how you can support our organization, I'm going to label that as leadership, is very different. So for us, understanding, you know, for me, I want to stop what happened to me when I was a child, and I want to see how that experience is connected to human trafficking survivors all over the world. I can, like the, the young person I shared about in the ER at the, earlier, um, you know, a young person, you know, <laughs> experiencing all of this trauma, still immersed in this trauma, it's still crystal clear that she wants to have her voice heard. Um, I want to end the arrest of victims. I always wanted to write a book, finding out what your own personal goals are that are about your desires for your own future and what you want to see in your own life and building your activism around this. Now, sometimes our goals are, are righteously rooted in anger, just knowing that something isn't okay. And so our goals can change. It can start out with like, you know, you just arrested a minor. This was a thing that happened for me when we started our coalition. There's a, there's a juvenile experienced what I experienced who's sitting in Santa Cruz jail or Santa Cruz juvenile hall right now. And that's not okay. And that changed to, okay, let's talk about how we get this done, which then changed to this is how we can do that together. And it's okay to have goals change. It's still rooted in that personal desire. Like maybe you always wanted to write a book, then you've written the book. Maybe you're done writing books. You have another bigger goal after that. But how we really make sure that it's from our own authentic joy, choice is by understanding our own goals. I'm just going to touch on that there also can be shadow goals, goals that aren't, um, that are more rooted in our trauma than in the change we want to see. Um, if I do this work, maybe I'll win a prize and or get an award and then maybe people will finally like me. Or maybe if I if speaking publicly, maybe this feeling I have inside of being dirty, maybe then people will see me a different way, or that survivor looks cool and I want to be cool like them. You know, there's different things that are just real, and I want to name they're human. Every survivor leader has them. Um, um, they're going to be different for different people, and we can treat them with compassion, but we can also keep them keep a perspective on them because they can divert us from our real goals, our real goals that are rooted in the life we really wanna have and the world we really wanna live in. Okay, as promised, there are many different sectors of survivor leadership. I, I intentionally put public speaking. This is um, for that person who asked that wonderful question or said that wonderful statement. Um, public speaking is just one of a million different ways survivors can be leader. We can create movements, we can do restorative justice, we can do advocacy, we can do peer support, 
we can do research, we can do art and theater, and we can create businesses and empower others and write and coalition build. And there are so many ways we can be involved in the movement that don't ever involve public speaking. In fact, my advice to new survivor leaders is hold off on public speaking, that that should be something that you work on down the road once you really understand your own goals what you feel your right role in the movement is using your own talents and your own what you enjoy doing um public speaking um may be and is you know there are people who are like survivors and professional motivational speakers this is their love of what they do other people it's a way you fund the work you want to do it's there's ways public speaking can be um in the mix but so often it's an exterior organization, maybe an organization that helped us, that are asking us, and that I would approach with a lot of caution. And I'm coming to the end here, and I just wanted to end on what I feel um, as a beautiful example of survivor leadership, um, uh, a group of survivors and allies in um, the East Bay here in California um, have come together to create during COVID-19, um, Beloved and Insistence. This is an art project, a collaborative art project, um, and that's involved creating this stunning mural in um, right on the track in Oakland, um, bringing out this message of insisting on the beloved nature of human trafficking survivors. Um, you can see this street art, the chalk art, you are divine. I see you shining this message to survivors on the track, survivor leaders who come together. Um, so this is an art project created by Regina Evans and um, Amara Tabor Smith, um, as well as a survivor collective called the Shade Movement um, for survivors in the East Bay, the San Francisco East Bay, as well as 20 other partner organizations, many of them of which are not survivor led that have come together to do these art projects that include dance um, on the track um, that happen every other Thursday um, through COVID-19. They share PPE with um, members of the community in Oakland. Um, that this is something that's really coming out of a vision, a survivor-rooted vision of creating the world we really want to see. So just a real quick recap, we talked that we want to leave you with the understanding that survivor leadership is necessary, the barriers to survivor leadership can be dismantled, and we need more survivor leaders, we need all of you to um, uh, understand your beautiful survivor leadership you're already doing and that you can do, we need more survivor leadership now and how. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, I can't wait to, I know we are running a little close, but, or, oh shoot, we're three minutes over, I'm so sorry. Um, do we have time for any of those amazing questions? I think so, if people can stay on just for another, I think 10 minutes or so, I, there've been so many questions, Deborah, and this has been such a powerful uh, presentation and there's so much engagement that I really am reluctant to, to shut it down on time. So if we can go until 2.15, please stay on if you can. If you have additional uh, questions, please put them in the question box, but I'll just read a couple that came in, Deborah, during the last portion when you were speaking. One survivor commented, it's incredible and unacceptable that human trafficking is a billion dollar business and survivors can't even get funds to rebuild our lives, we keep helping others because that's what we wanna do to heal and thrive to help others with the same. Uh, one person writes, uh, I will soon be changing my name and we'll be using a different name in order to do leadership as recently I've had a security breach. Mm, I'm sorry. That can be so painful having those, uh, uh, having those security breaches after we've done so much to keep ourselves safe. That itself can be just such a loss, a loss of a chosen name or a given name. Um, I'm sorry, um, but I also know you're doing that brave work to keep yourself safe. And I can add, you know, there are lawyers who will work pro bono to help you change your name. So you also don't have to do it alone. <laughs> um, one survivor commented, I agree, survivor stories and not even getting paid is like being trafficked all over again. So frustrating. Yeah. So if, 
and I so I didn't I didn't say this, but I would I would um, as survivor leaders, all of us as survivor leaders, I would encourage us as we're working with these different organizations to have a hard line that minors um, should never be asked to public speak that survivor leaders um, or excuse me, minor survivors um, need to have um, the um, the protection of um, coming at it from an adult perspective of what they want for their life before a lot of their options get taken away with having their story made public. Um, of course, I'm talking in cases where um, um, the, the survivor has been protected in the US usually, even with media, um, minor survivors, their identities would be protected. Um, but um, we can also encourage this in uh, each other's. It's absolutely epidemic, the pressure to do public speaking. And um, there are also a wealth of survivor leaders who that's that's their niche. That's the public speaking is what they want to do. And we want to, you know, encourage that to be paid. We want to encourage that. To, and we want to just encourage the broad breadth, breadth of survivor leadership. So another question uh, and comment that's come in is uh, I summarize uh, and tell my story. It's my story. I own it. I'm learning as I heal and advocate how to prevent human trafficking and help victims and survivors. Don't let anyone exploit you again. Listen to you first and then share what you want. Oh, so powerful. Whew. Yeah. I mean, I can feel that the um, the power this person has in saying this is my story and I own it. You know, I, 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 I believe this person, you know, that's something we could all just hold on to that. This is this is my story and I own it. So another survivor writes, um, I'm originally from England and there are even less services for international survivors and also a lack of help for children who uh, have been trafficked. And I know of, because this happened to my daughter and to me. Mm. So if there are any additional questions, I've gone through most of the ones and comments that have come through. If there are any additional questions, please send them across and I'll yeah, them to them. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Martina. I also wanted to name though a lot of those weren't questions. They were like they were like wisdom encapsulated into a little window. Like thank you all. Like just there's incredible wisdom here on the call. Um, just thank you for sharing that. So if you have questions, but also if you have things that you know you know to be true about survivor leadership, please um, share. Um, this is a chance for all of us. So one survivor wrote in, I love this comment. They wrote, I love the art. And people have asked whether they're going to receive a copy of the PowerPoint. And Deborah has generously said that we can email out the PowerPoint. Um, someone, Deborah, has asked, how does one reach other survivor-led organizations to work together um, with the one they're trying to put together? Um, a Survivor Alliance uh, is a huge resource for that. It's a fantastic network. Um, I'd also say, although it's gone more dormant in the last few years, um, the National Survivor Network, if you're based in the U.S., um, but survivor community, whether it's through these like just fantastic networks that have been created or um, um, informal networks. Sometimes we just, you know, we go to an event, someone shares a question, you talk afterwards, like real bonds, like real, like that relational power that we talked about can be um, um, just built in conversation and um, at these different events. So um, connecting with, um, but, you know, to fast track that, I would say Survivor Alliance is a great way to connect with survivor um, organizations. There's regional organizations which can be really strong. Um, if the person wants to type in the region where they are, um, um, maybe you know this can be a, a venue for connecting with um, other other survivor groups in that region too. So Deborah, someone has asked about organizations on the East Coast. If there are organizations you can recommend on the East Coast, and also how do you join into leadership and where do you start? There's some really fantastic models. I um like you know East Coast is a big space like California is a big state. Um, but um East Coast of the U.S. is I assume what that person means. Um, so Coalition of Immokalee Workers is such an amazing model. It's an organization of farm workers in this one region of Florida, the tomato pickers in, um in Florida, and 
so in that collective there's people who've been exploited through agriculture as well as people who are um, um, uh, been trafficked um, so all joined together and this model of people who've experienced people who are from a labor sector um, gems is kind of this model too it's focused on a labor sector so a lot of the people were trafficked but also um, people who've been exploited in that sector are also joined together because there's a lot of shared change that can happen both from trafficking and exploitation coming together um, so that coalition of Immokalee workers model the gems model and when I think of um, organizations on the East Coast that have um, like the, the deal with the broad spectrum of human trafficking um, like like National Survivor Network Survivors Alliance aren't industry specific they're um, they're for you know not ex survivors of exploitation but survivors of trafficking but of any form of trafficking uh, commercial sexual exploitation uh, in childhood uh, labor trafficking all the many many different forms of labor trafficking um, so there's like hubs of sur um, survivor alliance um, there's seems like such a powerful collective in Atlanta um, that's on the I not literally the East Coast but like an East Coast state um, these are kind of southern um, I don't know if maybe there's other people there too who know of um, survivor-led um, innovative work being done by survivor-led folks um, uh, in East so often when people say East Coast they mean the Northeast so maybe like people can put in um, and so one, one person has written I run an organization in St. Louis and her she's given her email address which is katie at healingaction.org so please reach out she says awesome. and there are folks in New Jersey who are asking also upstate New York fantastic uh, so also That's someone close. from Tampa Florida if anybody wants to connect so I think all of you are on the survivor leadership listserv that Roxy Farrow runs and so you can definitely connect with one another everyone has the right to post to that listserv so you can definitely connect with one another that way as well so oh someone has asked again for the email healingaction.org is the organization katie at healingaction.org so we're at 212 we're already 12 minutes over but I think the response Deborah to your presentation has been so overwhelming and so many people are so enthusiastic that I did want to sort of just give a few more minutes so you could answer a few more questions and so that we could hear a bit more of, of the really rich comments coming from the participants I think we need to wrap up I, I just want to say first thank you to Survivor Alliance for co-sponsoring with us thank you to uh, Maria Lozano for for working with us. Thank you to Roxy Farrow, who is the operations manager of the Human Trafficking Legal Center, who usually facilitates these meetings. I'm just a, a poor substitute for this particular meeting. Roxy will be back. Um, but but uh, thank you to Roxy for organizing everything. And thank you most of all to Deborah Pembroke, because I think this was, as shown by the response from the participants, this was a very important webinar with really excellent material and a lot of food for thought. So thank you for bringing us all together and thank you for all of the work and all of the heart that you put into this presentation. And thank you for all the work you do. It's an oh, honor. Thank you all. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Martina and uh, Human Trafficking Legal Center. And um, just especially thank you to everyone who shared their expertise and um, their experience and just their care in these incredible comments. So thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, Maria. Thank you.
so deborah, are you still there?